if you are yeah, if you're visiting or you're new, my name's Doug. I have the privilege of leading the team here. It's great to have you here with us this morning, and I'm going to ask you to open up a Bible to Acts uh, 23. I think that's kind of roughly where we're going to be. We're going to be doing um, doing it slightly differently this morning. If you if you're a regular here, you'll know that we don't normally do uh, four chapters. Uh, four chapters of the Bible in one week. Um, we normally do like four verses of the Bible in one week. Uh, but we are, uh, if you're a forward planner, I want to just let you know that we are three weeks away from the end of Acts. So we're going to do this week, and then we've got two more weeks of Acts, and then we're done. I, I know you're crestfallen um, that we come to this end of this five-year journey through Acts, it feels like. But uh, all good things need to come to an end. So there are three weeks left of Acts, and we're going to... We're going to do uh, yeah, like three or four chapters of Acts today, so we're not going to do what we normally do. This won't be a normal kind of a sermon. I'm not going to uh, read long passages because literally there's four chapters that, we're, um, that I'm going to try and cover, and you have it hopefully in front of you. You can have a look and check that I'm not making it all up as we go along there, but it'll take us a good part of the morning to read through all of that. What I'm going to do is give you a quick summary of, uh, of it. Um, and to just to help us um, orientate ourselves where we are, what's going on, and summarize those chapters and then zoom in on a couple of things that I think are very, very important for us to notice this morning. But as we, because it's kind of a different, um, like a kind of a different layout of a sermon and a, and a week for us, I want us to, I want us to pray for ourselves again. Uh, you may re- Remember a few months ago, I mentioned that it would be a good practice for us, and we've kind of already got out of the practice, which is probably my fault, uh, that uh, often like the, the preacher will pray for the sermon, uh, or somebody else will pray for the preacher, um, but it's not often that you pray for yourself as we come to a message. I don't know if that is your regular habit, it's probably not. It was never my habit for years growing up as a Christian, and it's still not always my habit when I, on occasion, end up listening to somebody else preach. But I think it's such a helpful habit for us to get into, um, that as we sit and as we come to God's Word, that is our prayer. God, would you speak to me? Uh, through whatever Doug has prepared, whatever your Word says, through these four chapters of this random book, I mean, you may not have even been to church for years, and now suddenly here we are in Acts 23, you'd have no idea You've like walked into a movie like two hours in and like that's what this morning might feel a bit like to you. I want to I encourage you that God is able to speak to us. E- each one of us, this is, the, this is the mystery of how God works that in a room of however many people are here, uh, looking at what we look at this morning, God is able, He knows exactly what you're going through and He's able to speak specifically into the circumstances of your life. Do you believe that? The five of you who believe it are going to pray with me uh, and hold to that conviction that God is able to do that. So I'm going to pray for us, and I want to encourage you to pray for yourself. Lord, would you make me attentive? Would you open up my heart? Would you help me focus my mind? You've had a long week. You've got another one coming. You've got this time now where our attention is given to God. Lord, would you speak to us? Let's pray. Yeah, Father, that's our, that's our desire this morning. We thank you and we remind ourselves that you're not the God who has spoken. Um, You're the God who continues to speak. We have your word and through the ministry of your spirit, you bring your word to life um, as we engage with it, as we sit with it, as we sit under it. And so I pray uh, for myself now that you, as I speak, you would speak through me as we focus our attention on your word and that for all of us in this room this morning, You would give us grace to hear. You know the longings of our hearts. You know our struggles. Um, You know our needs. You know the condition of our souls. You're our good Father, and you're able to speak. You're able to send us from this place this morning, knowing that we have heard from the living God. We've heard from the Father who loves us. And so I pray that we, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would shape us, um, you would encourage us and transform us through your word now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me give you a, a four-chapter summary. This is like bullet points um, where Dave left off last week. Paul is in Jerusalem, and basically everyone's trying to kill him. That, that's kind of like the summary of the rest of Acts. 
is that everyone just wants to kill Paul. So if you're not off, that's the, the headlines kind of thing. Like everyone just wants to kill the guy. Like he's planted a gazillion churches, and now as he gets kind of nearish to the end of his life, the Jews have had enough. And so there's a conspiracy to, to kill Paul. And uh, Paul's nephew hears about this. Uh, he overhears these guys plotting. They, like, they make a serious covenant. They said they're not going to eat anything. They're not going to drink anything until they take Paul out. And that's like a proper, like, we are in this together. We're taking this guy down. His, Paul's nephew overhears these guys plotting to do this, goes and runs and tells Paul. Paul sends the nephew off to the commander who's keeping Paul under, under guard there um, and tells him this. The commander reckons this is not going to happen on my watch. I don't want this happening, going down writes a letter and decides to send Paul to Caesarea. So from Jerusalem up to Caesarea, it's a bit of a trek. Not the longest journey, but it's a bit of a trek. And with like a proper um, 200 horsemen, all this whole crowd of people sends him off to Caesarea to go and find the governor. So the governor lives in Caesarea. He's sending him, he's making it the governor's problem. This is, happens in politics all the time. If you don't want to deal with something... You make it somebody else's problem. So he's making it the governor's problem, sending him off to Caesarea. Basically, Paul gets delivered there. The governor at the time is a guy called Felix. So if you're following along in Acts, you'll see Felix's name is mentioned there. Felix, and Felix is an interesting guy. Um, Paul is basically, the Jews follow Paul up to Caesarea, and they end up having the first of one of his trials there. The Jews are falsely accusing Paul. Basically, they're accusing Paul of sedition, of causing riots, of trying to overthrow the government, of blasphemy, of inciting the crowd, of all of these things that are all nonsense, okay? Paul, basically, the whole way through until he dies, gets accused of nonsense. None of these accusations have any merit, but they have this trial, and Paul defends himself, um, uh, shares his testimony again. So that's why we, in some ways, why we're skipping over some of these chapters, because if you've been with us for a while, we actually dealt with Paul's testimony of how he came to faith early on in Acts when he actually came to faith. And there are three times in the book of Acts where Paul shares his personal testimony again with like slight variances. And so we're not, we're not redoing that. You can go and find that. It's in the catalog of sermons and listen to that again because we actually dealt with these verses back, back then. Felix keeps Paul in prison, the governor but he's interested in, in, in Paul. So every now and then he like calls Paul to come and have a chat. He's like interested in faith or something or these religious discussions. And they have these kind of chats. And it's so random because it says, it's, it says there that he tried to solicit a bribe from Paul. So he's like one minute they're having a chat about issues of faith. And he's like, hey, Paul, like, what's it like uh, down in the dungeon there? Like uh, fancy some sunlight kind of thing, um, you know, whatever. You know, we're South Africans. We know how bribes work. Um, and so he's trying to do this, like, listening, inquiring about faith, but also trying to get a bribe anyway. Um, he leaves him in jail for two years. Two years of his life passed by there. Felix is out. Festus is in. Again, this is how politics work. Festus is the new governor. He gets asked by the Jews to move Paul now back to Jerusalem. Okay, the, Jews want, the Jews want Paul in Jerusalem. They actually just want him moving between Caesarea and Jerusalem because their plan is to ambush him and kill him. They're not interested in a fair trial. They just want him moving unprotected so they can kill him. And Festus says, no, this is not going to happen. Well, I'm not moving him to Jerusalem. Let me hear your problems. I can't find. Let's have another trial up in Caesarea. So they, there they are again. Another trial. Paul's sharing his testimony again, refuting them again. Festus gets visited by now the king. King Agrippa and his wife Bernice come and visit Festus. Basically like a, yeah, like a, he's just passing by and he, rocks up with his old mate Festus, and they start chatting. He says, hey, I've got this guy here, Paul. You know, you may have heard about him. He's causing a ruckus all over the place here, and Festus is interested. I mean, uh, Felix is interested. Oh, sorry, Agrippa. Oh, there's too many people in this story. I'm, so, I'm, gl I'm glad you all picked up the error there. You're just like, when are we getting to the end of this history lesson? Agrippa is interested. He says, I'd like to hear this Paul guy. And uh, so he says, yeah, cool. Like, uh, we can organize that tomorrow. They drag Paul out. Say, hey, listen, and Paul takes the opportunity again, and he shares his personal testimony with Agrippa. Uh, basically, not much happens. In that whole thing, Paul appeals to Caesar. This is what he could do as a Roman citizen. He says, I want my case heard by Caesar. And they're like, okay, fine. If that's your desire, then to Caesar you will go. 
and basically that's how Paul ends up going to Rome. Are you all still with me? Oh, you are. There are th- it gets much easier from here on in. There are three things I want us to see. I've made them easy so we can remember them. Faith, hope, and love. You may recognize those three terms from somewhere else in the Bible. We're not going to be going there. Faith, hope, and love. Three points. As Paul goes through trial after trial after trial, as you read these narratives, you read those chapters, it's just the same thing again and again and again. We see faith, hope, and love in him. It's interesting here when Paul is put under pressure, you see what's really in Paul coming out. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a universal thing about humans. If you want to know what's inside of somebody, just put a bit of pressure on them. If I wanted to know what you're really like or what you really believe, all that's needed is, is some pressure. Things to not go your way. Then we discover, oh, that's really what you believe. That's really what you're like. Those things are not what some people would say, oh, that wasn't me. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. That, no, no, no. That's actually really what's inside. All that needed was just a bit of pressure to squeeze it out because the rest of the time it can remain hidden. And here, under immense pressure, Paul gets squeezed. And what do we see coming out of him? Three things. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, first one, faith in God's sovereign plan. Faith in God's sovereign plan. We started looking, well, I think Dave ended last um, week in Acts 23, which is kind of roughly where we are. Verse 11, there's all this ruckus. Paul's been now kept kind of prisoner. And the Lord appears to him in Acts 23, verse 11. It says this, The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Have courage, for as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so it is necessary for you to testify in Rome. God gives Paul a promise. You've testified about me all over the place. You've testified about me in Jerusalem. You are going to Rome. You need to testify about me in Rome. Now, Paul is currently not a free man. He's stuck in Jerusalem. Things aren't going particularly well. And why I mention this is because I want you to remember there's still, there's still a couple of years to go before he gets to Rome. He gets stuck in Caesarea. He's not, a, he's not a free man. He can't just do whatever he wants. And I think one of the things that sustains Paul through the end of his life, because even when he gets to Rome, there's still another couple of years there. What sustains him is, the, is this um, faith in God's sovereign plan for his life. He had seen it uh, over and over and learned to trust it uh, in the years gone by and had come to a confidence that, God has a sovereign plan for his life that nothing can interfere with. I'll say it again. God has a sovereign plan for his life that nothing can interfere with. And this is massively important. I use the phrase like this, and this is a phrase I want you to remember. Under this point, it's easy to remember. Trust in the hidden hand of God. Trust in the hidden hand of God. Because for Paul, if you Think back through Acts, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens to Paul that we don't even have recorded here in Acts. Paul has learned, you know, the hard way I would say, to trust that God has a hidden hand. There's stuff that you can see in Paul's life, oh, that makes sense, that, how, how that happened. But there, are, there is the hidden hand of God orchestrating people and moving this around and planning this and putting this person in, in advance that n- Paul couldn't control. And as we see it in Paul's life, I want to remind you that this is the truth of what happens in your life. That you can see, you see stuff with your own eyes, but ultimately the hidden hand of God is orchestrating sovereignly everything in your life. You're in Johannesburg now because of the sovereign plan of God. Not because it was your idea. It may not be your idea. You may want to be somewhere else. But you're here because of the sovereign plan of God. You are married to the person you're married to because of, say it with me, the sovereign plan of God. Some of you are elbowing each other saying, see, see, (laughs) pay attention, you know. Some people need reminding. I made a mistake. No. Nope. You didn't make a mistake. 
the sovereign plan of God orchestrated the footsteps of your life. You are where you are. God does not make mistakes. God does not make mistakes. He has never and he will never ever make a mistake. The hidden hand of God. Why do you need to have a robust understanding of the hidden hand of God? Because sometimes life can get confusing. Life can get disorientating. Don't think for a second that Paul just skipped through the daisies, as it were, with his life. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago when um, Jesus had to appear to Paul and say, don't be afraid. I I'm with you. No one's going to hurt you. Keep on speaking. I mean, I and I said, you, know, you don't have to tell somebody not to be afraid if they're not afraid. Paul was afraid. Paul was a human. He had fears and anxieties. He didn't just waltz through life. He was, he was a man. He was just, just like us. And he needed the confidence of the hidden hand of God. When things don't go your way, this is when you need to be able to trust. It's easy, you know, when everything lines up, job's going lacquer, your marriage is cooking, your kids are fine, your finances are fine, the country feels stable, yada, 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 yada. Easy, easy. It's when those things don't all line up and the stars don't seem to line up and the pressure starts to come. Then, do you still trust that God has a sovereign plan? Can you still trust the hidden hand of God? Paul hung on to those words. It's necessary for testify in Rome. I can imagine him. Next week, we're going to look at the, the journey from, from, uh, from Caesarea to Rome. And everything that happens is, again, a couple of chapters of what happens there. It's not a cakewalk, the next chapter. I can imagine Paul the whole time thinking, Jesus appeared to me, you're going to get to Rome, you're going to get to Rome, you're going to get to Rome. Nothing will frustrate the sovereign plan that God has for Paul, and nothing will frustrate the sovereign plan God has for your life. God made promises to Paul, and they come to pass. And God has made promises to you, and they will come to pass. Now, I am not, you will know, if you're a regular, I am not an advocate of picking God's promises out of your promise box and then like reading them to yourself, putting them on the fridge and saying, well, it says it in the Bible, you know, I'm going to stick it on the fridge and just claiming promises that God made to other people and not to you, okay? You need to be careful when you appropriate promises, but there are promises in the Scripture that apply to every believer for all time. It's a long list. I started making a list and then I just edited it. It was like two pages long. I was like, this is ridiculous. We're going to be here till lunchtime. But there are a few that are bedrock promises that we need to tether to this hidden hand of God working. Do you believe? Do you believe with all your heart as you sit here this morning that God works all things together for your good? Guys, you have to believe it. You have to believe that God is using all things. He's working all things together for your good. All things means all things. It means the things that you hate. It means the things that you wish you could change. It means the uncomfortable, the sad, the bad. All things is all things. And that's why he's God, because he can take things that are, would be a disaster outside of his hand, and he's able to turn them around and make them something that's good in your life. Only God can do that. Only God promises to never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise for every believer for all time. You are not alone. You may have forsaken Him. Someone say amen. You may have. Listen, if you haven't wandered away or given God the silent treatment, you haven't been walking with Him for long enough. It's going to come. It's going to come. The sulks are going to hit you. You're going to ignore God. You're going to live in a state of prayerlessness. You're not going to open your Bible for weeks on end. It's coming for you. You will wander away from the God who loves you, despite your best promises and intentions, because that's how you are. And you know who will still be with you? The one who promised to never leave you or forsake you. 
you will be faithless and he will remain faithful. Nobody else is like that. He promises to complete the work he started in you. You didn't start it, he started it, and he will bring it to completion all the way at the end. He's not going to bail on you. He's not a pro- you're not a project that he started. He's like, this is just way too much hard work. Phew, I've bitten off more than I can chew with this one, you know? <laughs> let, me, let me try that one over there. It's a lot more promise with turbo. These eggs, whew, done. That's not how God works. Literally, I mean, there is, I'm going to have to skip through. You get, the, you get the point? Trusting in God's promises to you. His sovereign plan. These are part of His sovereign plan that He plans to do all of these things. And here's the thing that you need to trust. It's, what I said is God's sovereign plan. Many of us, and the, uh, we cause ourselves endless misery because we have a sovereign plan for ourselves. You have a plan for your life that you think it should go like this. And then when it doesn't, then we're like frustrated or devastated or we sulk with God or whatever. This is a picture that came to my mind. It only came to my mind earlier this morning. So you need to give me lots of grace with how this comes out, all right? How many of your parents have had your kids bring you artwork that looks something like this? I don't know what this is. <laughs> I don't think anyone does. You know, you, sometimes your kids bring you, not you, Jono, your artwork is amazing, Jono. The other clowns, the other kids is what I'm talking about. The, the, they bring their kids the artwork, and uh, you're like, oh, it's lovely. Um, what is it? <laughs> don't say that. Just assume that. It's, ask them to like, point out the meaningful parts of, I don't know what this is kind of thing. Um, this is what our plan for our lives looks like sometimes. It looks like a kid's drawing. It makes no sense. It's a garbled mess. And since we're in Paris, uh, this, is, this is actually, it was a reverse thing. This is how it came to my mind. Since we're not, we're not in Paris, our attention is in Paris because of the Olympics. Um, Claire and I were in Paris years ago, many years ago, and we went to the Louvre, because you have to do that when you're there. We're not arty people, so it was a very short visit. I'm not going to kid you that it was. We were just trying to find the Mona Lisa, and it took us forever. <laughs> have you been there? There's this sign that says Mona Lisa this way, this way, this way. And they basically take you the whole way around, and the Mona Lisa is like by the exit. The free advice for you. Just go the reverse route, and then you find that thing, and you can get out of there and get on with the other stuff. But when we got into that hall where the Mona Lisa is, you know, you're looking at the Mona Lisa, it's like, ooh, ooh, very impressive, whatever else. There is a painting behind the Mona Lisa. It's the biggest painting in the Louvre. It's called The Wedding at Cana. It is nine meters by six meters. It's this. There are 132 people in this picture. When you stand in that hall, it takes up almost the entire one wall. And everyone in that uh, room is looking at the Mona Lisa in the other direction, and this is what's standing behind you. I mean, the Mona Lisa is impressive, but this, when you stand there, nine meters by six meters, this is properly impressive. And I was thinking about this when I was watching the Olympics because they keep showing the Louvre. I was thinking when we stood in front of this picture, you can walk up to it because it's obviously like a wall. How, the detail and how impressive this is. There's 132 people. There's so many stories within this kind of story. This. Show the other picture. That's us bringing God our plan. God, I've got a cool plan for my life. Show us the other one. And God's like, I've got a plan. I think my plan's better than your plan. That was the picture they had. God, yeah, here's my plan. Check it out. And he's like, oh, what is it? <laughs> I can't make out what your plan is. Here's my plan, you know? And it, we, we think we have a better plan for our lives, guys. But we don't. And we make massive progress and our souls can find rest when you bank this, that God loves you and He has a sovereign plan for your life. And because He's sovereign and good, it means that His plan is the best for you and nothing will hinder it. It's not that He is sovereign and evil, so He's in power, but He's not good. 
so he can do what he wants, but you can't trust him. And it's not that he's good, but not sovereign. Like he wishes the best. He wishes he could do these things, but he's got no control, no ability to bring it about. He is both sovereign and good. Good and sovereign. He loves you, and his perfect plan will come to pass for your life. God's hidden hand. Paul learns to trust that. I had an interesting uh, and encouraging experience this week. I, uh, last week I wasn't here. I was down in the Eastern Cape in East London. And I was doing some teaching and training at an advanced Eastern Cape leaders thing. And I preached at a church on Sunday. And uh, sometimes when you preach at other churches, you, you, I'll re-preach something I've preached here. Sometimes I'll do something new, but often I'll redo something. If it what didn't go down in flames here, I'll repurpose it somewhere else. Uh, true story, that happened. So I was like, they were, I was speaking a lot down there. I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. I was thinking, what am I going to do on Sunday? And I decided to do a preach from Mark. You remember years ago we did Mark, Mark 10. Jesus has this encounter with the disciples, James and John, come and ask him if they can sit at his left and right. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? And then a few, chat, a few verses later, he meets Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, and he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And they have very different responses to Jesus. So it's a question of Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? I thought that's a great, great question to ask. A nice pastor will preach. We can have a time of sharing ministry afterwards anyway. So I get to the church. Um, I know like next to no one in the church, another pastor, Quentin Nicky are there, and a few others that I know, but no one else. So I preach this. Who do you, what do you want me to do for you? It was okay. It was very cold in East London. I was tired. Not memorable, I don't think. Um, close in prayer. Everyone, like a, like a communion, go home. Quent um, voice noted me on Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember. And he said, last night at our community group, Quint's one of his major gifts is taking what someone says on a Sunday and turning them into excellent community group notes. Some of you will have experienced that. And he did that with my preach. I think he reworked it, and he put it into something helpful for the community groups. And they looked at that question, what do you want me to do for you? And they went around, and there was a lady who's been in part of their community group who joined the church, I think about six or eight months ago. She's not a Christian, but she's been attending mainly because her daughter likes going, friends with one of the kids in the church. And they went around the group. They thought this would be a great way to ask this question. What do you want me to do for you? And they go around, go around, go around. This lady, they get to her, say, what do you want me to do for you? She says, I want to be... I want to put my faith in God. I want to become a Christian. I want to get saved. And they were like, what did you say? She said, I want to get saved. I want, I want to become a Christian. Decided, I want to become a Christian. And they're like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Now, they've been journeying with her for six, eight months in this group there. So they prayed for her. They helped her. They led her across the line of faith. She is right now, as I'm speaking, sharing her testimony in Everyday People Church in East London. And they're going to baptize her probably in about 20 minutes' time as a brand new believer in Jesus. Now, yeah, I don't know. I hope you're clapping for Jesus because I just randomly picked a sermon. I thought this would be helpful. And Quint randomly put some notes together. The hidden hand of God is at work. Someone was pursuing. We know God has been pursuing this lady month after month, maybe year after year. And it comes to her head on a Tuesday, Wednesday evening in East London, this morning, she will be baptized as a new believer in the family of God, and heaven will be rejoicing over her step of obedience. The hidden hand of God. You have to trust that God is always, always at work for your best. Okay, let's speed it up here. He has faith in the sovereign plan of God. He has, secondly, has hope in the gospel. Paul always takes every opportunity to testify. And before Felix, in Acts 24, if you're still there, Acts 20, jump to Acts 24, verse 14. After he's refuted some of the accusations, he says this, but I admit this to you. I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way which they call a sect, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. I have a hope in God, which these men themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection, both of the righteous and and the unrighteous, and I always strive to have a clear conscience toward God and men. There's three things I want us to see under this section. 
Paul lives with this, with this hope in the gospel. He, he not only says to the Romans that the gospel is, is the hope of salvation, that it's through the gospel message people have become saved. Paul lives with this reality that all of his hope is in the message of the gospel. He says, firstly, he says, I worship God. I believe everything that's in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. He says to Felix, look, I, I, I'm, I'm not a deluded fool like you think I am. I know what the Old Testament and the prophets all say, and I can see that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that was promised, everything that was predicted. It's a perfectly logical and reasonable thing to th believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And I worship that God. Not, not some new God. I'm not a part of a cult. I worship the God who you see clearly through the Old Testament, through our history here. He is a worshiper of God, and he believes everything that's in accordance with that. The second thing he says is, I have a hope in God that there will be a resurrection. He says, just like these guys who are accusing me, because the one political party that were accusing him, they believed in the resurrection. The one didn't. Between the Sadducees and Pharisees, they need to go into it now. But one of them believed in the resurrection, the others didn't. And he says, I, I have the same hope as, as these guys, that there will be a resurrection, pay attention, of the righteous and the unrighteous. This is really important. I want you to remind you that this morning that if you're a Christian, there is a resurrection coming your way. That you're going to die, most likely, unless Jesus comes back. You'll die. But then one day you will be resurrected to stand before Jesus Christ. That if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you wouldn't call yourself a believer, that also for you, you're going to die, and one day you will be resurrected, and you will stand before Jesus Christ. So everyone, that's what Paul says, there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. We're all going to stand before Jesus, and there will be an account given. What have you done with your life? One guy put it, phrased it like this, I don't particularly like it. Why should I let you into heaven? I don't really like it. But I think we have to answer for our life, for how we lived, for our sin, for our offense against God. This is the message of the Scriptures, is that for the Christian, when we stand before Jesus, this is our confidence. You just point at Him. Say, I was with you. I put all of my hope in you. I put all of my hope in you. You know that, Jesus. Remember me? All of my hope was in you we get to spend eternity with him. For what Paul calls the unrighteous, there is, what the Bible explains, awaiting the unrighteous, an eternal separation from God. Which is difficult news to hear. It's hard. Some people would push back. They don't believe it. It's just what the Bible teaches. When you stand before Jesus and say, okay, you rejected God's means of salvation. You rejected the free gift of Jesus Christ. Away. Off you go. Eternity without God in suffering because you rejected the only means of salvation. And Paul says, I have a hope that there is a resurrection coming for me. He knows he's going to face death. Death doesn't scare him. He says it again and again to Felix. He says, I'm not scared of dying. I'm not scared of dying because I have a hope that a resurrection is coming. Imagine living like that with a real, real reality. You're not scared of dying. Because you know there's a resurrection coming for you. And that resurrection, the first thing you're going to see after that resurrection is the God who loves you. And you're going to stare full in His face. And you're going to say, all of my hope is in you. And you're going to be safe and secure with Him forever. That is the confidence of believers in Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you don't have that confidence, we would love to help you and lead you to Jesus in a relationship with Him so you can have that confidence for yourself. Paul says, third thing, I strive to have a clear conscience with God and with man. This hit me like a ton of bricks. It's amazing. I, he says, I want to have a clear conscience with God and man. Isn't that an amazing way to live? Paul says, I have a clear conscience. When I think of God and my relationship with Him, I have a clear conscience. My sin, the sin issue between me and God has been taken care of by Jesus. My hope is in Him. All of my confidence is in Him. And I've received from Him grace and forgiveness and new life. There is, there is no barrier between 
me and God. Our relationship is good. But then as he, as he thinks of his fellow man, he says, I've got a clear conscience with my fellow man. There's no issues between me and other people that I'm aware of. I've, I've tried to make peace and resolve those things. It's not that Paul didn't have haters. I mean, Paul had a long list of haters. I mean, th this whole thing comes about because they're trying to kill him. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like people don't like you or speak badly about you. But it says that as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes it doesn't depend on you. But his conscience is clear. His conscience is good with God and his conscience is clear with man. Let me ask you quickly as we just double click on this kind of thing. I hate that phrase, but it, the only way it works in my notes here is it opens up in another thing here. What if your conscience isn't clear? What if you're sitting here this morning and you say, my conscience isn't clear between me and God? My conscience weighs me down. He's not here this morning. He's coming next week because I can talk about him. I met for a guy with a guy for coffee this week who wants to turn his life around. Invited him to church. He messaged me before church. He says he can't get you. He's going to come next week. One of the things that he said to me is that I'm struggling with shame and guilt and regret. I'm not talking about him. He'll tell you the same story if you meet him again. He says he can't shake it. Try for 20 years to get away from it. He says, just can't, can't shake it. Shame and guilt and regret. He says, wait, wakes up every morning and it's just right there. And he just spends the first 30 minutes of the day trying to push it down. That is not a man with a clear conscience. How do you get a clear conscience? You need your conscience cleansed. You need your heart forgiven. You need your shame taken away. Every single one of us have done things you are ashamed of, that you're guilty of, and that you regret. What will you do with those things? How will you live with your conscience? You give those things to Jesus. You realize that he's actually taken those things to the cross with him so that he bears them so you don't bear them. So your conscience is clear. Not that they didn't matter. They mattered a lot. They mattered enough to send Jesus to the cross. But now they no longer stick to you because they stuck to him. And you are free to go. It's different living that way, friends. It's different living that way with a clear conscience, with God. And it sends us out into vertical relationships with one another to say, I want a clear conscience. I want to look every single human I know in the eyes and say, as far as it depends on me, I'm living at peace with everyone. And you need to do whatever you can to make sure that you are reconciled to people uh, like that in the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. The last thing we see Paul living with, faith in God's sovereign plan, Hope in the gospel is a love for people. It's a love for people. Listen to Acts 26. This is the end of Paul's testimony before King Agrippa, right at the last, last build part of his stay there in Caesarea. Acts 26 from verse 24 to 29. As he's saying these things in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul. Too much studying is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly to him. For I'm convinced that none of these things has escaped his notice since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. Paul has a love for people that you see again and again in his life. Whether they are Jews or Gentiles, whether they are fans or enemies, he loves people and his love for them his love for them causes him to speak a clarity of the gospel message to them so that, in his words, that they may become like he is. That they may become believers in Jesus. That's what he's saying. That they may become believers in Jesus like he is. And again and again, you see it through the Acts. He's happy to share his personal testimony with people. And I just wanted to mention this, that the power of, of us sharing our personal testimony do you know why God, if you're a Christian here this morning, do you know why God saved you 
with your own story is because your story, as you speak it, speaks particularly to somebody else who may need to hear something from your story that may cause them to believe the truth and the reality about Jesus in a particular way. There is something unique in, in the way God sovereignly worked your story that God wants to use. That's why we don't just hand out books with facts and stuff to say, here's all the facts about Jesus, read it, naturally you'll be convinced and become a Christian. It's because God works through the uniqueness of story that the way God saved Doug Fell and how he engineered my life speaks to the lives of others that I'm sharing with, that sovereignly he is able to use those things. So I want to encourage you to use your personal story and testimony. Don't shy away from it. Paul says, I wish before God that you all might become like me. Because a, a love for Jesus means that we will have a love for others and we will sh want to share with them. We will want for them to become like we are. Not perfect, not perfect, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. There was a study on... Um, that the Barna group did. It's a, it's a research group that does studies on the Christian faith. They did it a few years ago um, on millennials and sharing their faith. Um, this is what the study found, that 95% of millennials thought that the best thing for someone is for them to come to know Jesus. Are you with me? 95% answered the best thing that can happen to you is that you become a, a Christian. 75% of them said, they felt equipped to share their faith with somebody else. So 95 think it's the best thing that can happen to you. 75% of them felt like, I know how to do that. I feel equipped to share my faith. 47% of them agreed that it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hopes that someday they will share that faith. 95% believe it's the best thing for you. 75% feel equipped to do it. 47% believe it's morally wrong to share your faith with somebody hoping that they would become a Christian as well. Something went wrong in that chain. And I think we live in a culture here where it's okay if you believe, just don't require others to believe. And Paul is a challenge to us. He says, I, I, wish, I wish that for every one of you, you were like I am that you would know Jesus like I do. Guys, it's, 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 time for, it's time again for the church to rediscover its boldness and its courage and its conviction through the power of the Spirit that we speak. We don't just live as Christians. We speak, and we personally testify to who Jesus is and what He has done for you in saving you and turning your life around and continuing to be the main bedrock of the reason why you exist. And may God help us with that. When the pressure comes, God leads you through trials. Three simple questions that pull it all together. Will you continue to put your faith in His sovereign hand? Will you keep your hope in the gospel? And will you love people as God has called us to do that? The only way the only way we get to do that is in and through Jesus. And as we come to celebrate Him again in communion, I want to give us time to sit with those questions. I've said a lot in a whole bunch of different directions. I want to give you time to just sit and say, okay, well, we prayed at the beginning, Lord, would you speak to me? I say, hey, well, Lord, what have you been saying to me? How do you, here's the next question of our prayer. Lord, how do you want me to respond to you in the light of what you're saying to me today? If you're a Christian, there'll be ways to respond. If you're not a Christian, you may need to respond to God. By the way, communion is only for the Christians. So if you're not a Christian yet, we ask you to hold back. We'd love to share communion with you when you are a Christian, but it's not for you yet. If you're not a Christian yet, asking that question, what is God saying to you now? Where is He taking you on this journey? And let's come before God now. Ask Him to search and encourage our hearts as we come to celebrate uh, communion together. Let's pray.
Father, we, we confess that we, we struggle with your sovereign plan. And because your hand is hidden, we often find it difficult to trust you. We just confess that this morning. We pray that you, in your kindness, would give us grace and faith to trust you again. That you are good. You are good and you are sovereign. And that when we can't see what your hand is doing, we trust what your heart is all about and the way that you're working out our lives for your purposes and plans and for our ultimate good. And I pray that you would mercifully wash those truths over our hearts this morning, particularly for those who are struggling with that this morning and have frustrations around what life looks like and what your timing looks like, that you would give them grace to trust you again this morning that your sovereign plan is for their very, very best. That we would afresh put all of our confidence and hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we have no other hope outside of you. One day we're going to stand before you, resurrected, we're going to stand before you. And our great hope is that you are sufficient for us. Just as you've said, you are and you will be sufficient for us. And we give you our yes again this morning. We say all of our confidence, all of our hope, all of our trust is in you. And we pray that you would give us love for those who have yet to believe that message. Fill our hearts and move us in fresh ways this morning. We come to remember you now, Jesus. A body given for us, blood shed for us. No one has loved us like this. And as we eat and drink together, we do this in remembrance of you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the name above every other name, Jesus Christ. We love you, we worship you, we adore you this morning. Would you come and continue to speak to us, come and help us, give us grace to respond what, to what your Spirit is doing amongst us this morning. In Jesus' name.